So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Khalila Reynolds, also known as the Money Queen. And I'm going to give you a bit of my story, a bit of my backstory. Some of you do know me. Some of you already follow me on social media. But all you know is I should talk about money all the time. But why is this so important? Well, one, every, everything takes money. But I'm going to tell you some of my journey. And you heard Ricardo's journey coming from August Town. I am actually from a country named Belize which is a tiny country. No, I'm not Jamaican. Yeah, I've lived here for about 15 years now, married to a Jamaican, have Jamaican kids. But I was born and raised in a tiny country in Central America named Belize. It's the only English-speaking country in Central America. Population when I was growing up, 300,000 people. So when I said tiny, tiny, right? 10,000 people in my community named Belmapan. So I grew up in a very small community. And I grew up hearing from my father all the time, this is what you must do in life to be a success. And I want you guys to tell me if this sounds familiar to any of you. You must study hard, study a book. Everything from my dad, study a book. Why, why are you listening to that music? You know, you know your book like you know the music? Study a book. Study hard, you get good grades, and then you get a job, and then you work hard, and you're going to earn some money. Hopefully, you get promoted over time. And then you buy a house. And then you've made it in life. Sound familiar? Sound very familiar, right? These are the steps to success, according to my parents. Well, I studied very, very hard. A very bright girl in school, just like Ricardo, you know. I was one of the top students at my small school. Then again, I guess it's not so hard to stand out when <laughs> you're in a very small school, right? But I was one of the top students. And I got a scholarship to go to Fordham University in New York to study journalism, which was my dream. And then, right at the age of 19 years old, right as I was finishing up sixth form, boom, guess what happened? Pregnant. I heard a few of you say it. I got pregnant. Yes, the smart girl, you know, the one who was the top of the class, the one who nobody would suspect out of all the way. She, Kalila? Get pregnant? Like, wow. Okay. And my father said to me, my same study of book father, said that he would not support me unless I had an abortion. Yes, he did. He said that to me. And so now I was in this place where I had to make a moral decision at a very young age. Do I pursue my dream of studying journalism and becoming a journalist, or do I have my child? And I have this moral sensibility that in my mind abortion is wrong. But fortunately, my mother stepped in and my mother said, no worry about him. I will, you know, I will work on him and we will support you. And so I was able to pursue my dream and raise my child at the same time. But there's an important reason that I bring up this story. See, you can be on all the path to success in life and then life happens to all of us. Boom, things just happen unexpectedly. The person who was caring for you, who was supporting you, has a heart attack and dies, what do you do? You suddenly find yourself a single parent like I was. Things didn't work out with the father of my child. I had to raise her on my own for several years until I met the person who's now my husband. And that's a whole nother story that I could go into as well. But things happen in life. You may think that you have your life all planned out. I had this grand vision for my future and then my daughter come and say, hold on the mommy. I'm, I'm in here. You have to plan for me too. And so planning is exactly what I did. That was the first skill that I had to learn in my adult life. So had her at 19 years old. And so I started my adult life with the responsibility of another person. I've never had the freedom as an adult of just being able to go party and just you know, doing what I want and making reckless decisions with money. I had to be responsible from day one because it was always you know, me and her. 
and it was just me and her. And even though I had a supportive family, I wasn't the type of person who wanted to burden my family with any you know, additional expense. And I wanted my child to have the best. I wanted her to go to, to prep school, to private school. So how would I pay for this on the small salary that I was making as a journalist? Because you might not know this, but journalists don't make no money in, <laughs> in Belize nor in Jamaica. It is not a high paying career. And people told me this before I went into it, but I said, oh, I, I don't care. I just want to do something that I love. Anybody sound like any of you? You just want to pursue, you want to be a teacher because you love it and you want to make an impact on the world and on the students. And that was my thinking too, and it still is. I'm still a journalist to this day. But when you realize that you have yourself and your bills and your picnic for support, you also have to start thinking, well, what else can I do? How else can I make ends meet? So the first skill I learned was budgeting. So I had to figure out how do I do more with the little money that I am making. And I started putting together a spreadsheet and calculating this and I had apps and I was figuring it out along the way. But I quickly realized that that wouldn't be enough. And let me not say quickly, that's a lie. It took me years to realize that there were other ways as well that can help this along the way. Now, as a journalist making a low income, Belize and Jamaica, it took me about 10 years before I was able to buy my first car. So I was time walking, taking public transportation on CVM TV, you know, big, big CVM. Anybody remember Tivoli Incursion? Yeah, that was me dodging bullets. Yeah, that was me, Donna Tivoli, that was me. Anybody remember a dopey story in Spanish town? That was my story, I reported on that. With the, guy, the, the boy on the chair, on the dopey pulled the chair, that was me. <laughs> oh, now you know who I am. <laughs> yeah, so I was on big, big CVM TV, reading the primetime news at eight o'clock, and then on the bus, in full makeup, at nine o'clock, with my child, having her out all hours of the night, because in media we work weird hours. You work, you, most of us work either early morning or late at night. And so when I worked early morning, I was there braiding her hair during commercial break. When I worked late at night, she would sleep under the table literally with me. And then we're on the bus, me and all my TV makeup looking fancy, in my suit, on the bus, J-U-T-C, going home. Can we not make no money? You get me? So it took me 10 years before I was finally able to buy my first car, a car that I still have today. The company now owns that car. I've been, I just never wanted to let it go because it's you know, emotional to me to have that car. Now here's what happened when I bought the car. I went to NCB and I took a loan. So now I have enough income that NCB actually give me a loan, but this is what they did. They said, now that you have a car, you're gonna need gas. You're going to need insurance. You're going to need, oh, what else you need when you have a car? Um, fitness, license and registration. Uh, when the tire bus, you need new tires. And then you have to service it every three months. And so many expenses come with being a car owner. So here's what we're going to do for you, Miss Enriquez. That's my maiden name before I was married. That's my name before I was married when I got the car. We're going to give you a credit card. And so I got my very first brand new credit card. And you guess what I did with it? I walked across the street to Style Savvy Boutique and I swipe it and swipe it and swipe it. Oh, I went on a shopping spree. And of course, when school fee time come, normally I would save up the money for the school fee but well, this time I have my credit card, so I'll just swipe it. And of course, when I want to go out, I'll just swipe it. And so I run up a very large credit card bill very, very quickly. And of course, the bank statement comes and they said, oh, you owe $100,000, but you only have to pay 5,000. Just make the minimum payment 
Are you good? But then I realized I'm making this minimum payment, and I'm paying them the 5000 or the 10000 every month, and after several months, even though I'm paying the bank, I now owe them more than what I borrow. So even though I borrowed 100000 and I'm paying you back 5000 every month, how come I now owe you 150000 The math ain't mathing. And it's because I didn't fundamentally understand or take the chance to understand how credit cards work. And how interest works. Even though I, I learned this in school, I took maths to Ricardo. I know how interest works, but I didn't realize that the average interest rate on credit cards in Jamaica is. Anybody want to guess? How much? How much? 30%? How much do you think it is, miss? 40? Anybody else? 45? So you guys are in the right range. See, I thought it was like 5-10%, but it's actually 40%, 40. And that number is actually greatly understated. That's according to the Bank of Jamaica. But that number also includes US dollar credit cards. And US dollar credit cards have a much lower interest rate. It's about 16, 17%. So most of the JMD credit cards, which is what they give most of us, those are about 50% and over. So when you average the 50 and the 60, they come down to 40 and it looks like it's not as bad as it is. But most of our credit cards right now are about 50% interest rate. And you have to understand that if you are going to have and utilize a credit card. And this is what I wasn't understanding until the bill started hitting me and it, there came a point when, and you know what happens too, the minimum payment goes up. If you're not bringing down your principal, your minimum payment is gonna go up each month. And there were a couple months that had to call me on the phone, Ms. Enriquez, are you gonna make a payment? When can we expect a payment from you? And I started um, making a note of the numbers and saving them as do not answer. <laughs> Until I could figure this out. I said, you know what, Kalila is smart. You can figure this out. And so I developed a system that would calculate and forecast how much next month's credit card bill would be through Microsoft Excel, how much the interest I can expect to pay would be, and figure out how can I pay off this credit card in one year, in 12 months. How much would I have to pay off on this credit card rather than making the minimum payments every month? And this is called my debt repayment calculator. If you email me later, uh, I'll give out the email address and I'll send it to you for free. If, anybody of you, if any of you are struggling with credit cards, trying to figure that out, I will send that to you later. I'll tell you how you can get it. So yeah, I had to figure out how am I going to deal with this debt? Because the, the car loan was easy because that's the, uh, the tech that straight out your salary. That's a salary deduction. But the credit card, no. That just keeps cycling and cycling and cycling. So the thing about credit cards versus other types of loans, when you have a regular loan from the bank, they give you, you know exactly when you're supposed to pay. They know, you know exactly how long the loan is for. They're going to tell you it's for five years. At the end of the five years, the loan is paid off and you're good. There is no end date for credit card debt. It just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing forever until you decide to do something about it, until you make a plan to pay off that credit card debt. And so that document that I created was extremely important in helping me to figure out how to pay off this credit card. Now I'm at a place where I love credit cards because at that time I was like, I hate credit cards, this is evil, this is how they get you. But now I realize, okay, there's a way to use this tool to your benefit. They have points and they have uh, rewards and you can get miles and all these things. And it makes you uh, better able to access credit, such as loans if you're responsible with your credit card. But you have to know how to use it correctly. So I'm at this point in my journey now where the first major thing I learned in my early 20s was budgeting. And then my early 30s was how to use a credit card. And then it wasn't until a few years later that I found out that, you know, there's actually more to this thing because 
I am here trying to save for a house. Because my father told me that you must what? Go to school, get good grades, get a job, work, buy a house. And I'm now in my 30s, and I can't buy this house. Because I'm trying to save towards this deposit for the house. And it's just not happening. Because every time I save some money, the house price go up. So let's say the house that I wanted cost 20 million Jamaican dollars. And you want to put down a 10% deposit, I say, okay, you need to save 2 million. By the time you save the 2 million, the house costs 30 million. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and now you need to save how much? $3 million. So now you're behind. And you know what causes that? There's one word that explains that process. Inflation, bright people, yes. Inflation is an increase in the cost of goods and services every year. Every year, price of things go up. So this year, a party, how much for party now? Three bills, they lied. Party is not three bills. <laughs> That's if you buy the cocoa bread too. One party is $300? Two hundred and sixty. Wow. See, I don't even look on the price in the mouth. <laughs> One patty is $300. That's insane. Wow. But yeah, that's the point. So every year the price of things goes up. What's the lowest you can remember a patty ever cost? $99. So you guys are telling on your age right now. <laughs> Depending on how much a party cost when you were growing up, $50, $100. When I came to Jamaica, it was about $80 for a party. And now it's nearly $300. That is insane. So that's how much? How much? Oh. <laughs> so that is how much inflation has impacted us over the years. Inflation, and not just that, but also devaluation because there's a period we're under the IMF program and every year the money were less and less and less and less. When I came to Jamaica, the JMD to USD was 75 to 1 and now it's 155 to 1. So every year your money worth less and less and less and this is why when you try to save toward big goals like buying a house, it's like the goalpost move. Soon as you reach, the price gone up. Every time you save, the price gone up. You save again, the price gone up. And it's like you're running backwards, right? Now, around this time, I was fortunate that in my job as a journalist, I started learning about the stock market. Because now I started pursuing finance journalism. Because I was one of the few people in the newsroom. I don't know if any of you know this, but a lot of journalists become journalists because they hate maths. Most people in the newsroom, they're like, oh, I'm an English star. I did great in English. I did great in literature. I hate maths. And so in almost every newsroom I've worked, anything with numbers, gikalila. Nobody else wants to do it. So I started reporting on the economy, and I started reporting on businesses and companies like one-on-one -on -one that now list on the stock exchange. And through that process, I started learning about the stock market. And at some point, it dawned on me that, whoa, a lot of people are making a lot of money on the stock market. And why am I here just reporting on the stock market and not investing on the stock market? Why am I telling other people about all this money to be made and I'm not doing it myself? And so at some point, I became an investor. Now, here what happened with my first investment. Anybody ever hear about IPOs? You know what the IPO is? It's the first time that a company lists on the stock exchange. So IPO stands for initial public offer. Initial being the first time. Public means it's going to the public because before that the company is privately owned. If I have a company, you can't buy shares in my company. Me own it. But if I take it public now, I open it up to all of you to become shareholders. And then offer is when I offer it to the public. So me now, this was a time, it's about 20... Late 2017, 20, early 2018, I think it was. And me here, IPO coming out. Exciting. IPO hot. 
Yes, I'm going to invest in this IPO. I put some money in it. And the IPO was a complete flop. Because I did not even read nothing about the company. I just hear IPO and I'm going to invest because all IPOs are good in my mind. This is what I heard, right? So I just put money. I never read nothing. I don't know what this company does. I just decided I'm going to invest and I'm in. And then the IPO flop. Fortunately, it wasn't a terrible flop. I didn't lose money, but I didn't make any money either. So it was just as bad as just keeping the money in the bank. But that taught me an important lesson. I need to now figure out what do I need to look for in a company that I want to invest in? What are the important things? What makes a company potentially profitable? What makes a company a potentially good investment? And so I started doing the research. And I started reading everything I could get my hands on. And I'd, I remember I would download books on Kindle because I couldn't bother wait the two weeks for the book to reach Jamaica. And I started using Audible app and I started listening to every bit of information when I was driving my same car. <laughs> when I was driving, when I was on the treadmill, when I was just getting ready in the morning, I started binging, binging, binging to learn everything that I could in the fastest time that I could learn it. And I learned a very, very, very valuable lesson from that. And that became the course of what I would eventually become doing, which is doing this full time now, helping other people to learn you know, the keys to wealth creation and the things that you need to know in life. So the good thing about it is that you don't need to take 15 years like I did to get from stage one to stage three. You can find all of this information right now, and if you email me, I'll tell you how. You can find all of this information easily. So there are three things that you need to know. Number one, anybody remembers number one? Budgeting. You need to know how to manage your money. No matter what amount of money you make, it is important for you to understand where your money is going and assign it a place to go. Anybody know that song from Sasko? Hand to mouth as you get the money. It done. Yes, as you get the money done. You have no idea where your money is going. And the reason for that is that you're not assigning a place for your money to go. You're not telling your money where to go. So your money decides it's just going to hop up out of your pocket and just go where it wants to go. Unless you take control of it and you prepare your budget. So that's number one. Number two is what? How to manage debt, especially credit cards. So number two, how to manage debt. That's the second important thing that you need to know. How to use it to your advantage and how to not fall into that debt cycle. And then number three is investing. Right, learning how to make your money work for you. <coughs> Excuse me. So I have a slight cold. Got it from my kids. You guys teach. Are all the kids always sick right now? Because my picking them every week, one or the other or both of them. Every time they get sick, me get sick. Anyway, yeah, where was I? Stock market investing. Yes. So there are two ways that you make money through the stock market. People, this is one of the basic questions people ask me all the time. Kalila, how you make money from the stock market? Anybody know the two ways? Anybody know the two ways? I can't hear you. Stand up, stand up, let me hear. Buying stocks and trading stocks. Oh, you're, on the, you're warm. You're warm. But that is the basic concept. You want to buy and sell. Yes, please. Anybody else want to take a, take a guess? Bond statistics? Okay, bonds are different from stocks. All right, let me just tell you, let me just tell you. There are two ways. One is called price appreciation. That is when the price of something goes up. The idea is to buy low and sell high. So if you buy a shoes, all right, let's give um, Kanye's Yeezy, what? what is the shoe's name? Yeezy's, the Yeezy shoes, right? 
My money easy just bus. And I see the picture like on the news in America, the line around the corner for the Yeezus. Yeezy, the Yeezy shoes, yeah. Line around the corner, you wonder why would people line up for so long to buy the shoes? Unless the shoes cost $500, right? But they know that soon as the shoes sell out, the price is gonna go up because now they can resell the shoes for a thousand dollar. So the idea was to buy low and sell high and you do this exact same thing with stocks. So you want to buy a stock at a low price and eventually sell it at a higher price and then you make a profit. So when one on one listed on the stock exchange, it was a dollar each, the shares for one on one were one dollar. How much is your share price now? A dollar and 20 cents. It even went as high as $2.50. So if you bought a block of shares at a dollar each and you were able to sell them at $2.50 each, you made a big profit. You get it? That's the simple concept, just like anything else. Even at the market, you buy and sell, you buy low, you sell high. That's called price appreciation. We also call it gains. Very easy word to remember. What did you gain on the stock? Now, the second way that you earn money from the stock market is through dividends. What are dividends? Dividends are your share of a company's profits. So every time one-on-one -on -one makes profit, I don't know what your dividend policy is, but let's, let's use this as, a, as an example. How much? 25%. So every time one-on-one -on -one makes a profit, they pay out 25% of their profits to their shareholders. So if you own shares in one-on-one, -on -one, you get a piece of Ricardo's profit. So these are the two ways you make money through stock market investing. And this can help you to beat inflation, which is like running backwards with your money. And this can help you to get much further along to where you want to go. And I'm gonna wrap this up by telling you a happy ending, not really an ending, but the, the story is coming full circle. So it took me 10 years to buy my first car. Five years later, struggling, still couldn't buy the first house. This past weekend, my husband and I made an offer on a house. <laughs> and we feel so accomplished. We feel like it's happening. And how were we able to do it? Not through savings alone, not through managing the credit card alone. One of the ways that we were able to get there is through investing. So now we've accumulated a large portfolio. We are gonna sell a chunk of our stocks and use that to put down the down payment on the house. And so if you are interested, I'll leave you with the pitch now. <laughs> You can email us. I'll ask you to write down the email address. I need to find an easier, an easier way to say this. But it's admin, A-D-M-I-N, admin at kalilaraymedia.com. So Kalila is K-A. Say that again. She'll put it in your classroom. Perfect. Perfect. So it's K-A-L-I-L-A-H-R-E-Y.com. Admin at kalilaraymedia.com and we'll send you the budgeting template that I use, that I developed all over all those years, the debt repayment calculator, and a broker guide that can help you to choose a broker to open your investment account, and I'll send that out to all of you for free if you just email us. Thank you very much, and let's get this money.